it's really great that you're interested in, in, in what I have to say uh, about this uh, rather sad uh, topic. So this is a research that I've been doing over the past few years uh, after I finished my PhD. I sort of wanted to make sense both of my political involvement and uh, what generally happened to, to, to the country because uh, not just me but many people, uh, not just in Hungary but experts, political scientists, sociologists are facing a hard time to understand the success of authoritarian populism in Hungary. So the results of this research are currently being published in various articles and I'm also uh, I just finished a book on, on death of democracy in, uh, in Hungary that should come out in the, in the near future. So, uh, let me begin with uh, basically talking about what the puzzle is that we're trying to, to explain and uh, trying to understand how, and how alternative theories are unable to do this. So, um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the story of post-socialist change and transition from socialism to capitalism uh, and I'm also quite sure that most of you have heard about the recent democratic backsliding not just in Hungary but also in Poland and many other countries uh, but I, what I think would be interesting to start with uh, is, uh, <coughs> is that the story looked quite different just a few years ago so Hungary and many other countries were considered as uh, uh, the most successful cases of post-socialist transition and the idea was that the combination of economic liberalism and political liberalism would be sustainable and sort of even uh, the, the end of history. So what this graph shows it's, uh, is, is basically that the more economic liberalization you have, the more democracy basically you will have. That was the dominant idea of, uh, of the liberal modernization paradigm during the 90s. And everyone thought, well, Hungary is doing great, so democracy established, stability, um, economic and political liberalism, nothing to worry, right? Well, um, as I'm sure you all know, uh, currently the Prime Minister of Hungary is called Viktor Orbán. He has been uh, re-elected in 2010 because he has been already a uh, Prime Minister between 1998 and 2002 uh, but the really interesting turn began in, uh, began in 2010 and then he was re-elected again with a two-thirds majority in 2014 and 2018 and this means in Hungarian context that he can do whatever basically he pleases to, to the country, change institutions and he has been doing it, uh, completely restructuring uh, the economy, uh, but also most importantly the political system, uh, resulting in a significant erosion of democracy. What I find really interesting though is, uh, is the way that he managed to establish his political majority. And for this I think it's, it, it's, uh, it's good to look at the electoral map in Hungary. Uh, so this is how it looked like in 2006 when the socialists lost won uh, the election, the national election in Hungary. Uh, and uh, so in a Hungarian context you have the red which is the, 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 the color of the Socialist Party and you have the orange which is the, the, the color of, of the Hungarian uh, center-right. I will use left and right uh, throughout this presentation but it m refers to political positions in Hungary. It's, it has nothing to do with mostly with policies or with the content of policies. Uh, mostly the Hungarian left has been more to the right in terms of economic policies than, than the actual right. So this only means on the left you have, actually on the left, you have the Socialist Party which is the uh, uh, sort of the legal continuation of the pre previous state Socialist Party and then on the right you have the dominant party Fidesz. You have smaller parties as well but for the sake of this presentation these are the two major efforts. And, uh, so in 2006 uh, uh, and in several other previous elections, the socialists won in Budapest, but also importantly in rural Hungary, uh, they managed to win important seats uh, in parts of the country which, uh, which uh, saw significant industrial modernization during socialist times. So these can be considered the previous industrial strongholds that after the transition uh, underwent significant deindustrialization. But still until 2006, 
the socialist party was very strong in, in, in these uh, uh, towns and regions that we could call, or might call, the Hungarian Rust Belt. So these are the deindustrializing areas, former industrial strongholds. But what happened is basically a complete wipeout of socialist support in, in basically all over Hungary, except with, with the exception of a few local electoral districts. And in this, I'd like to emphasize uh, how the Socialist Party has disappeared even from its previous regional strongholds from these industrial towns. Now, Fidesz has won significant amounts of new votes in villages and small towns as well. And that's a different story. And it's a very important story uh, also of the new right-wing hegemony in Hungary and the rise of authoritarian populism. So I'm not arguing that it's only about the industrialized towns, but what I'd like to argue is that they are strategic and politically very important part of the story, especially because they were strongholds of the left and strongholds of the uh, working class historically. So what the result was is basically uh, a significant decline in the, in the quality of democracy uh, after, already after 2006, so that's when the socialists were in, in power, but especially after uh, 2010. So the, the thick black line shows Hungary and if you compare this to the previous uh, chart, where Hungary is at the top as a success story of political and economic liberalization, this shows something completely different. So this really surprised most of liberal theorists and modernization theorists, and they couldn't really explain how this could happen to a country that was previously believed to be a front runner of uh, liberal institutional change. So I think the question that emerges, how do we explain the puzzling U-turn in democratization and the rise of authoritarianism in Hungary? What do existing alternative theories say about this? Well, there's uh, basically these theories uh, uh, follow the lines of uh, more general international debates about the sources of populism. Uh, so you have people who argue that it's all about the political elites, they talk about the supply of illiberal ideas, they analyze politicians' uh, maneuvers. Uh, and with regard to Hungary, you have uh, uh, theories that, uh, that uh, approach the democratic backsliding in Hungary from the perspective of, of a captured state. So it's a political, small political group that has captured the state and installed what they uh, sometimes call a mafia state. So it's a small political minority working or operating as a mafia. And, and basically destroying democracy. So very often they also portray this as sort of an irrational power-hungry politics in Hungary. Very often the, the, these words are used that it's anti-business politics that is, uh, that is being uh, exercised currently in Hungary. So it's a complete reversal from everything that was, uh, that was liberalism in Hungary. So they, they think that it's about bad politics and this bad politics is what leads to bad institutions. So one could argue that they see these individual character flaws at the top, but it's still about individual character flaws from the perspective of a liberal mainstream. But this then begs the question why good politics from this perspective was successful until 2006 and bad politics only successful after 2010. So I don't think that this really uh, helps us explain the dynamism uh, of, uh, of change. There's a second approach. Um, the culturalist approach. Uh, and if you have uh, read about populism, I, I'm sure that you have encountered similar arguments from other parts of the world as well. <clears throat> and in the context of Eastern Europe, these researchers very often portray Hungary as a classless society, so there's not really class conflicts, distribution of conflicts don't really matter, people don't really have, a, um, they don't really take their interest in, in a, economic interest into consideration what they will. Uh, some even argue that it's particular historical legacies of nationalism and uh, some even call it the servant mentality that has uh, been inherited from, from the long distant past of Hungary which sort of determines political outcomes. And very quite often you can read these kind of intellectuals arguing that this is basically what people deserve. So they are like this, these, these are their attitudes, that's what they inherited from the past. So this is the natural state of, of Hungarian politics, this kind of authoritarian politics, uh, populism. 
So it's bad attitudes that they see leading to bad institutions. Again, they see individual character flaws from the perspective of liberal modernization theory, but this time at so-called at the bottom. But uh, actually, this is uh, this is not really true that there was uh, a high demand for populism in 2009. This is from Pew Research Center. They did a, they did a survey in 2009, and I don't want to get into the details. But what this shows is that. Uh, in Hungary, you had the highest level of support for various liberal institutions and liberal ideas compared to the Czech Republic or Slovakia, which didn't see such an increase in authoritarian populism after 2010 or after 2009. So this doesn't really fit the picture of an inherited political culture that is sort of uh, represents a demand for populism. And finally, there's the losers of modernization thesis, so this kind of political economic approach, uh, which is closest to, to the argument that I'm going to present. But sometimes they also concentrate on, on individual attributes and define the socioeconomic status as an individual at, uh, attribute, talking about poverty and unemployment, which uh, tends to generate a misleading debate about whether the poor would support the populist. And then some liberals point out that, well, the poorest actually are not supporting the populist, so economics doesn't matter, so it's only about culture. But I think it's a completely misleading debate, because it's not really directly about poverty, but it's about the lived experience of class. So what we need is a, is a culturally and geographically sensitive political economic theory that is able to combine political and, and cultural variables into a political economy. So what I'm proposing to do is, uh, is a new, you might call causal narrative and a new concept for, for the emerging state in Hungary that has been institutionalized after 2010. And the first uh, building block of this theory is, um, is about the working class and working class nationalism in particular uh, in, in, in Roosevelt states uh, or, or counties and, and towns. Um, to understand this, you have to look at the context of global capitalism which, uh, which tends to fragment and polarize society in various ways. In the economic sociology literature, you have this debate about labor market dualization, or in economic anthropology, you have uh, this literature about double fragmentation. Um, and the, double fragm the idea of the double fragmentation, I think, really nicely captures what is going on. So you have a kind of a, a horizontal fragmentation which uh, means that with globalization you have a weakening of the, of the state, but at the same time you have a vertical uh, fragmentation, which means you have this rise in the new cosmopolitan elites. Uh, this not only means economic holders of economic capital, but also the so-called credentials, so people with high amounts of, uh, of cultural capital, so very highly educated people who can sort of integrate along the economic elites globally and then you have a second group, uh, what you might call the working classes, and you have this, uh, I don't really like the term, but I haven't found a, a better one so far, so you have the underclasses, so this can, to be, can be various kinds of minorities or migrant people, and so you have this kind of uh, threefold conflict uh, emerging between the new cosmopolitan elites, working classes, and, and underclasses. But this also has a particular geographic dimension, as I already mentioned, um, so with globalization, um, you have a, a strengthening of uneven, regionally uneven development, which in former socialist countries and also in capitalist core countries, so highly industrial countries, led to significant uh, deindustrialization in particular uh, uh, parts of, of these countries. So you not only have an internal, international polarization, but you have a polarization within these countries. Uh, these British sociologists, Hall and Savage, they talk about urban vortexes, which I think really nicely captures these processes. So you have emerging new towns, regional strongholds of economic growth, with high concentration of both cultural capital, so educated people flowing to these towns, new companies establishing, and then you have the old industrial areas, which sort of lose both their human and financial capital. And this industrial decline then not only has economic implications, but it er erodes local identities, local institutions, and, and local communities. So this is a complex loss of industrial life. That's why I think it's, 
better to look at this uh, in this contrary sensitive way than just from a simple uh, economic deprivation perspective. The second uh, process that I, I propose to look at is how globalization resulted in a, polar in a polarization of the economic elite. And for this, you, you have to uh, take into consideration that uh, most of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, but in particular Hungary, embarked on a, on a dependent development path. So this meant that uh, policymakers and political elites thought that they would open up the economic borders, invite transnational corporations, and this would solve most of the problems that the country had around the end of the 80s, creating new jobs, uh, uh, resulting in, in, in a rise of uh, uh, living standards, etc., etc. But what this led to is, a, is, is an internal economic disintegration. So you, you, so you have regions and sectors of the economy that are dominated by uh, international capital and you have other segments of the economy that are uh, <coughs> more available for local capital and there is very little connections between the two. So the growth in, in, in international capitalist segments of the economy didn't really spill over into domestic capital. So if you, have, if you are economists, you, I, I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, uh, FDI spillover literature, which in, in the case of Hungary quite clearly shows that there wasn't really much of a spillover happening over these last years. Foreign investors upgraded their production, but this didn't really affect it domestic capital. So this led to a polarization of the economic elite, <coughs> and uh, because domestic capitalists didn't really see uh, uh, much room for further growth, they revolted to, uh, against those people who institutionalized this kind of dependent development. And finally, uh, the result uh, of this is a kind of authoritarian capitalism after 2010, which I propose to call the, uh, the accumulative state. Uh, and um, um, for this, uh, what I find particularly important to emphasize is that this authoritarian state follows the logic of capital accumulation. But also, it's not a direct result of capitalism. So it's not that you have capitalism, that, uh, but then eventually you will end up with authoritarianism. I'm not ar arguing like this. Uh, you need a particular uh, political and cultural fact to take into consideration particular political and cultural factors as well. So uh, the data that I'm using is um, these are different uh, kinds of data. Uh, first, I'm using uh, macroeconomic and macrosocial statistics. I also did qualitative interviews with workers with the help of great research assistants. Altogether, 82 interviews in four the industrialized towns in, in, in the Hungarian Brussels. I did a sort of quantitative uh, analysis of revolving doors between the state and the capital. This uh, rests on two new data sets on, on the economic elite. And finally, I met the political instruments of the cognitive state that are used to, to accelerate capital accumulation. So uh, let's look at the working class briefly. It's a complex research, and what I can do is only to show you some of the highlights, the sort of snapshots of my research with the hope that you gain some appetite to, to read or ask further questions. So um, as I mentioned, uh, after the collapse of uh, real existing socialism, Hungary underwent a substantial deindustrialization, and the new capital that arrived in vast uh, quantities to the country didn't really uh, help to counterbalance this kind of loss uh, of employment. So this is what economists call jobless growth. You, so you can have economic growth, but this doesn't really produce uh, new jobs, and very frequently the types of jobs that this uh, growth produces are precarious jobs. Also importantly, uh, there is a persistence of international income inequalities, and this is particularly important when a, you know, when a worker com co compares his living or her living standard to uh, 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 the living standard. In the case of Hungary, it would be typically uh, an Austrian worker. They would not look at relative uh, convergence in terms of percentages, but let's say they would compare how much do I need to work to buy a particular type of car. So this is absolute differences. And actually, the sad truth is that absolute differences uh, measure that purchasing power parity between Austria and Hungary in terms of the net average income have uh, substantially increased between 2000 and 2010, so when Viktor Orban took power. 
So there wasn't really much of a wage convergence either. But it's not just poverty and low incomes. It's a, it's a, it's a widespread de declining quality of life. And here, the interviews that I did with workers really helped to understand this. Because very frequently, they talk about how the collapse of socialism eroded all kinds of security that came with existing socialist companies, like security of, of the jobs, the security of income, but also other types of services like holidays that people could use related to uh, these companies, but also very importantly, housing. So people were able unequally, but still to get access to uh, state subsidized or company subsidized housing. <clears throat> so the collapse of all these services and institutions with the collapse of socialist companies resulted on, uh, in, in a very complex uh, process that led to a decline in quality of life, even among those people who are not the poorest among those interviewees. And another very important uh, uh, phenomenon that I found, uh, found is, uh, is a very uh, massive collapse in communities, and I cannot really give you all the details uh, of these interviews. I, I just thought I would show you this one. But it's really pervasive throughout these 82 interviews how people talk about the loss of communities as privatization in, in increases competition between workers, as precariousness erodes job security and people start to fight against each other, but also as deindustrialization erodes local services, sports clubs, companies, cultural clubs, and also as these ver urban vertexes suck out human capital from these towns, so educated young people leaving these towns which basically results in a, in, a, in, a, in a complex loss of communities in, in these towns. So what this ends up in is a, is a, is a loss of hope around the second half of the 2000s. Uh, so people were quite hopeful uh, in, at the beginning of the transition. Uh, they were also quite hopeful about foreign capitalists, uh, especially e e expecting from them that they would contribute to an increase in, life expect uh, in, in living standards. But this is not what happened, and they see kind of a loss of hope that it would get in any way better. So you would consider that this is a fertile breeding ground for a kind of left-wing politics, but it's not. And the reason is twofold. First, uh, when you ask workers about how they would define themselves if they belong to any kind of group, or just listen to them how they talk about this processes, it's always in first person, uh, first person singular, so there's no really a kind of group identity that, that emerges. And when you ask them about class, about the working class, they think it's, 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 a, it's a meaningful category, but they also think that it, in terms of identity, it doesn't really exist. So people don't think themselves as members of the, of the working class, although very often people think that they are workers and they should re regard themselves as workers. But also a very important uh, <coughs> statement that, that frequently was, uh, was uh, like, uh, detectable among the interviewees is that they, they thought that the left was not really fulfilling its, its, its role in terms of representing the traditional workers. Very frequently uh, this is related to privatization, how the left was involved in all kinds of corruption affairs, but also their uh, approach to, to austerity, but also their lack of organizing of, of the working class, so the weakness of, of, of socialist party local, local groups. So this kind of creates a, 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 a gap, and uh, the only, I would call it, narrative identity that emerges is, is the nation. And people define the nation in a, in a very economistic way. So this is not a cultural definition of the nation, but it's about solidarity and protecting each other. Uh, but very frequently, this is not a universal uh, solidarity community, but it's uh, a community that is not available for foreign uh, migrants, but also very frequently not available for, for members of the underclass who are very frequently defined as undeserving. So the political result was that uh, the support for the socialists among working class people declined very significantly, whereas the support uh, for Fidesz and Jobbik among working class people uh, between uh, 2002 and 2010 uh, skyrocketed. So the working class basically abandoned the socialists uh, in large numbers, 
uh, uh, either becoming totally passive or actively supporting right in groups. But the story of the working class and the nationalism is only part of, of the story. And I think it's even more important to look at the elites because this explains uh, really uh, the stability and of the, 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 the functioning of the new regime. So as I mentioned, there was this drive towards foreign economic liberalization, uh, kind of seeing transnational corporations as the solution to most of the problems. And they did in fact contribute to, to economic development, but they also polarized the economy. Just one figure about this polarization, I could give you thousands. This is about uh, domestic value added share of exports. So how much national capital is able to contribute to exports compared to international capital? And you can see that it's uh, basically a con 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 continued decline after, constant decline after 1995. So uh, national capitalists can't really access global markets and that's where you can really make huge profits it's all dominated by transnational corporations. And there are other measurements that would show, show, show a similar procedure, um, but the, the, the bottom line is that you have this polarization between international and national capital. Now politically, this also led to a kind of political polarization. And I created a new data set to measure, measure this. So this is a data set about economic policy makers uh, before 2014. Uh, and after 1990, covering every government and every, uh, uh, every senior economic policymaker in the country, so that is ministers and state secretary. And it shows that uh, left-wing, so-called left-wing governments, uh, their economic policy person personnel has uh, had much stronger connections to the transnational corporations than right, so-called uh, right-wing uh, governments. And this is especially pronounced after 2010. So you you, what you had is basically uh, what political <coughs> scientists and sociologists describe as, as, as an alliance between technocratic politicians uh, and, and transnational corporations that institutionalize this particular kind of dependent development with all sorts of policy tools that favored uh, transnational corporations, but uh, really uh, led to uh, an increasing uh, disillusionment among national capitalists. And they started to uh, turn towards the political right. So uh, this is the, these are the connections of, um, of, of uh, national capitalist groups. And as you can see, this is the third right-wing government. So Viktor Orban's government after 2010 uh, has a really significant higher share of economic policy makers, ministers and states of secretary. The whole, who, who have experience, who were managers in, uh, in companies that were owned by domestic capitalists. So you have these kind of uh, polarized revolving doors between international and national capital and the right gradually opening up towards, uh, uh, towards national capital. You can <coughs> detect a similar, a similar process if you look at the economic elite it's in itself and this shows the political connections of the top 100 billionaires in, in Hungary from 2002 until 2018. This is based on, on, on publicly available reports. It took quite a lot of time to code all of their uh, connections based on what is, what's available in the press. I followed a, a, a quite conservative approach, so I only coded left or right leaning uh, if, if uh, it was really uh, obvious. But the most important uh, message here is that in 2002, you had uh, a majority of left-leaning uh, billionaires, so-called left-leaning billionaires, but the number has been constantly decreasing, and the number of right-leaning billionaires has been increasing, and already in the middle of the 2000s, so before Viktor Orban took power, the majority of the national bourgeoisie was supporting uh, Fidesz and was actively seeking uh, to help uh, Fidesz to gain, uh, gain power. Crucially, these are not just friends and members of family related to Viktor Orban, because very often you, you read in newspapers how Orban and his son-in-law and his favorite uh, entrepreneurs are enriching themselves, which is really horrendous and, and, and part of the story. These are the people that I call political capitalists. But there are other uh, capitalist groups that are supporting Orban. So I, I differentiated between these groups based on their strategy of capital accumulation. So where does their money come from? Primarily from the market and how is this related to the state? So political capitalists are completely unable to make money on the market 
all of their money comes from the state through public procurement through their political friends. You have committed conservatives who, who made their fortunes on the market but still are quite strongly committed to supporting Fidesz for ideological reasons. These are people who very often fund uh, media corporations, right-wing media uh, outlets in Hungary. You have a very significant group that I call rising national capitalists. So these are investors who also made their money on the market, nothing to do with Fidesz in power, uh, but they also supported Viktor Orbán to take power and then they st still support him in power because they are hoping that he would institutionalize a regime that supports national capital more uh, compared to the previous, uh, previous, uh, previous regime. You also have these kind of co-opted capitalists who are uh, businessmen who supported uh, uh, left-wing governments, even if you look at the previous uh, chairman of the Liberal Party in Hungary, he's also, uh, he, for one of the years, he was a, a member of the top 100 uh, billionaires in, in Hungary. So even him is now, uh, he's now uh, one of the supporters of Viktor Orbán. He takes part in, in these international economic trips. He, and he, he thinks that the efforts of the government to support national capital are uh, really helpful. So that's what he, he said. You also have uh, these passives who are not really doing much in terms of helping Orban, but they are also not revolting, which is important if you consider uh, liberal modernization <coughs> theory, which very often uh, maintain that you need to create a local uh, bourgeoisie, which would sort of demand political, liberal political rights and a protection of property rights. Well, in the case of Hungary, they are not really protecting or demanding any kind of liberal rights, at, at least not actively. They might do it at home, but not really publicly. So what the result is, is a kind of authoritarian populism in, in, in action embodied in, in what I call the cumulative state. This is, uh, I, I borrowed from, from an economic historian or social historian called Alan Wolf, uh, and uh, I define this uh, accumulative state as a political strategy of the dominant power bloc comprised of international capital, national capital and the nationalist faction of the political class to manage the conflicts of accelerated capital accumulation in the context of dependent, uneven development. So Viktor Orban uh, incorporates national capital into the dominant power bloc, decreases uh, some of the power of international capitalists, but also keeps them in the power bloc, especially technological capital, uh, and accelerates capital accumulation both for political capitalists, but also for national and international capitalists. And this leads to all kinds of social problems and social tensions uh, and for this uh, uh, Orban relies on authoritarian solutions to consolidate this uh, new regime. So I could again talk a lot about this but these are the most important uh, political instruments of the cumulative state uh, in terms of um, accelerating capital accumulation. I, uh, identify how they impact national capital and transnational capital and their most important uh, factions. So you have the political capitalists, most of researchers focus on this, you have emerging capitalists, you have the passives, and in transnational capital you have the non-tech sectors and the, and, the, and the technological sectors. So for example, a lot of the uh, 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 state capture literature or the, or the literature in the mafia state, you have this argument that it's public procurement has been centralized leading to corruption which is definitely a very significant part of the story but I would also point out that there has been a very significant decline in international foreign investment in Hungary and public procurement and public investment is used to shore up investments in general and contribute to economic growth so I wouldn't say that other types of capitalist groups are victims of this type of uh, uh, measures the state has also institutionalized new revolving doors, so they incorporated political capitalists into economic decision making, but they also incorporated uh, emerging capitalists. So you have all kinds of political commissioners not related to Viktor Orban in terms of friends, being friends or family, but still being member of the government responsible for various economic affairs. Crucially, you also have this regime of uh, strategic partnership agreements with transnational corporations that is meant to ensure their support for the new regime. 
They institutionalized the low tax regime, so Hungary has now one of the lowest uh, corporate tax rate uh, all over the world. Uh, but also they dec decreased uh, personal income tax to 16% uh, and at the same time increased the taxation of lower income people. So this basically meant a redistribution from the bottom to the top. Uh, various austerity measures, keeping state budget below uh, 3%, increased supply in low-skill labor, which is particularly important from the perspective of national capital, which is located mostly in non-technological sectors of the economy, and they need low-skilled uh, laborers. Some of the transnational corporations also need these, but some of them are complaining about this, so that's why you can see it's either plus or minus for transnationals in the, in the, in the high-tech sectors. Uh, but for this, Orban completely restructured the educational regime uh, leading to a significant decline in university enrollment in Hungary, leading to a decline in the compulsory education age, and an overall the de significant decline in the overall performance of, uh, of education in Hungary. And finally, what I want, I want to emphasize is this the flexibilization of labor regime. Uh, this had also roots uh, previously but this has been in increased significantly, so the government changed the labor code two times. In both occasions, uh, the, the, the general goal was to reduce the protection of labor and, and increase the, the potential for entrepreneurs to, to, to use labor more flexibly. So, although the working class uh, in large numbers supported Viktor Orban in 2010 and after it, but the new regime is not really supporting the working class. So in fact, it leads to an extreme polarization, both in terms of wealth, but also in terms of incomes. Uh, so this uh, uh, orange line shows the increase in financial wealth. I didn't really find good data on financial uh, or wealth inequalities, but I looked at the details, and this is increase in wealth, mostly that is in assets that are owned by the top 10 uh, of the wealthiest people. So this is not really an increase of wealth for middle class or working class people, this is an increase in wealth for the wealthiest. At the same time, you have a skyrocketing of income inequalities in Hungary as the incomes of the top 20% uh, increase and the incomes of the bottom 20% have stagnated after Viktor Orban took, uh, took power. So for this type of social tensions to, to not to uh, endanger uh, Viktor Orban's power, he is in part relying on authoritarian solutions. He's also relying on nationalism as a way of creating consent among people. So it's not just authoritarianism, it's also creating consent through nationalism and then the context of nationalism I was already describing. So to conclude, um, the theoretical lessons are, I think that existing theories are insufficient <laughs> to explain authoritarian turn in Hungary and I propose a culturally and geographically sensitive political economic approach. Uh, importantly, liberal market policies led to insecurity and anxiety, especially concentrated in the Hungarian Rosbad, and this provides the context for the rise in neo-nationalism. So one of the lessons is that economic growth uh, doesn't really necessarily lead to better quality of life. Another crucial lesson is that the business class and the various factions of the business class is currently supporting uh, an alternative state in, in Hungary. So again, a, 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 a common hypothesis that Ambourgeois men and the rise of new uh, elite, economic elites would lead to more political liberal rights is, is, is not true for the case of Hungary. They are not necessarily uh, facilitating democratization. And finally, some lessons for, for politics. Uh, I'm sorry uh, for running uh, out of time a little bit, but uh, yeah. So, uh, first, uh, to, to prevent this kind of authoritarianism, what the Hungarian case shows is that you need to be able to integrate the working class along the more inclusive lines, as opposed to uh, nationalist definition of, of, of solidarity. But crucially also, nationalism as a mobilization strategy also only works if other kinds of uh, narrative identities cannot really emerge on the ground. And for this, uh, a fa political failure of, of it, this is a, a political failure of the, of, of the left, not just in Hungary, but in other countries as well. Uh, to avoid the polarization of the economic elite, uh, politicians 
uh, should not think that foreign investment solves all the problems. It definitely contributed to, uh, to economic improvement in Hungary, but it dis doesn't solve all, all kinds of problems. And in particular, uh, many institutions and policies that do not let the national <coughs> business class uh, become too nationalist and revolt against uh, liberal institutions. And for all this, I think we need to rethink the role of the state in development. Uh, what I would call, or many call, a democratic developmental state. Um, so it's a kind of state that both invests into human capital, but also in uh, uses industrial policies that can facilitate the growth of of uh, of, uh, of uh, domestic industrial groups, uh, both at the same time. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, of course I am very happy to answer now or later in. Uh, Should we? Should I answer all questions uh, immediately, or should we collect? Or um, I'm very happy to answer immediately. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay. So, uh, well, I think it's a, it's in part a post-socialist story, and in part a story about the, indu the industrialization and the collapse of working class communities that you can see all around the world in the, in, in all the industrial areas. So this is happening in the American Rosba. This is happening in the in the British Rosba. Uh, and this has happened in the Hungarian Rosbad as well. So these kinds of economic processes contributing to the collapse of, uh, of uh, previous life, industrial rivals and the demobilization of the working class. But crucially also, there's a post-socialist story here, uh, where as there was a, a talk by Timothy Gerton Ash here in Cambridge uh, about the transition, where he basically summarized it uh, by saying that the left hand of the transition, uh, the right hand of the transition prevailed over the left hand of the transition. So this means all kinds of uh, policies and politics that devalued the working class and led to a complex status loss among working class people, which also does not really help uh, for workers to organize. And third, there's a symbolic legacy of state socialism and, and the language of class, which doesn't really allow, I would say, the elites uh, to talk in terms of class, because the interviewees that I asked, they didn't really feel, uh, felt uh, uncomfortable uh, talking about the working class, but this hindered politicians to develop a kind of uh, left-wing narrative. So the dominant narrative of the left in ha Hungary was a kind of a modernization narrative, integrating into the global economy and, and sort of going west, uh, not talking about uh, class issues, because it was a thing of the past. I think the one in the back was first at the end. Uh, thank you so much for this very interesting talk. I was wondering, I mean, you're very impressive. You lined out several dimensions, several different dynamics, which is structural uh, programs, and then the, how the elites evolved, and then how the electorate changed. Um, I was wondering whether you also found some sort of an interplay, what happened first, in the sense that was it first the rising nationalism and therefore the electoral outcome, or was it structural um, conditions that then led to the ele elections to play out in that way so how like basically a head and egg problem what was first yeah I'm not sure I'm able to answer that question and I also think that it would be very very hard to answer so I think these are mutually reinforcing procedures so you definitely have a kind of structural background for nationalist thinking among working class people uh, but you also have uh, nationalist politicians that eventually realize the power of these kinds of nationalist framing. So you need both. And Fidesz changed strategy uh, during the second half of the 2000s uh, when they moved from a more um, cultural definition of the nation to a more uh, social definition of the nation and talking more about social issues in a nationalist framework. But crucially, they also invested a lot of money and energy and time into organizing the working class uh, through what they call the civic circles. There's great research on that, how previously local organizers of Fidesz, who were more these kind of middle class people, didn't really manage to talk to these working class people. But the directive from the, from the party center, the headquarters, was, well, you must do this. 
And the way they did is they, they organized local events and, and the language of nationalism was very important. So you have both, you have political entrepreneurs and you have this structural driven demand for nationalism, but I don't think this would be a stable coalition. <coughs> so I think they would have collapsed if there's no support from significant segments of the economic elites as well. And I think this explain, explains part of the difference if you look at, for example, Poland or Czech Republic or, or, or Hungary, where the economic elites are less enthusiastically supporting illiberal politicians than in, in, in Hungary. mentioned uh, the poll about Hungary having the highest, uh, hung like Hungarians having the highest support for, let's call it, liberal democratic institutions. Uh, yeah. But then again, there's the democratic backsliding, yeah. openly anti-liberal, yeah. illiberal democratic, as they call themselves, a uh, government, yeah. uh, being uh, constantly very popular. The same with the EU, there is an openly Eurosceptic government. Yeah, and the same in Poland actually. Uh, the various both Hungary and Poland are consistently yeah. uh, pulling the highest on on support for the EU. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first question: how you how, how do the two come together? And the second is more political. So I was wondering that there is. So you mentioned that like class talk was discredited by uh, by state socialism. Basically, yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, this technocratic leftism is also very relatable to, you know, like their yeah. through the yeah. uh, Clinton yeah. and to some degree to Obama. Yeah. Uh, and do you think that the same way that it wasn't just simply discrediting class talk and left thing talk by socialism, but also the general atmosphere? Of that's there. And then they should make like a reverse, like, you know, like potential, well, not <laughs> potential, no, but you know, like the uh, <coughs> people like Bernie Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn or I don't know, yeah. uh, perhaps a left wing turn of the German <coughs> left uh, could uh, <coughs> kind of regain the working regain class. Regain the, the discourse, and that would, yeah. I don't like this terminology, but trickle down to yeah. the center this um, yeah, thank you for the questions. Let's let's begin with the, with the second one. Um, so I, I I I definitely do agree with you that it's uh, not just uh, uh, as I mentioned, it's not just a, a post-socialist story about the discrediting of the class, but it has been a general uh, intellectual mood uh, in the eighties or especially in, during the nineties. So the idea was that basically, you know, it's the end of history. I don't think I need to describe this uh, uh, to you. And uh, liberal and left-wing politicians subscribe to this in Hungary, but also in Poland, really, really enthusiastically. So they wanted to be uh, uh, Tony Blair, uh, multiple by Tony Blair. So they really wanted to do. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that they all been neoliberal because the story is more complex than that. You had substantive redistribution in Hungary, but they definitely didn't create a kind of working class identity. They, they subscribe to the language of globalization, uh, modernization. So that's definitely part of, the, uh, part of the story. And I definitely think that the left or progressives, if they want to be successful, they need to, in that perspective, be able to learn from the new right. And the new right was able to talk to working class people, especially in the industrialized areas. So if you look at the support for Donald Trump, uh, yes, it's been in part about a uh, large segment of Americans not wanting a woman after having a black as a president, so, so gender definitely part of the story, race definitely part of the story, but it would be impossible to explain the success of Trump without his ability and, and the Republicans' ability to attract both black and uh, white working class uh, supporters. Uh, so I think there's a, uh, there's a need for change in, in, in that respect. I'm more skeptical about uh, Eastern Europe that it would happen uh, easily. So I don't think that it could trickle down because you have this institutional past with a much weaker labor movement, which much weaker, much weaker political organizations. So I think that's the direction, but it will take uh, or would take really, really longer. And in the meantime, you perhaps need to be more 
like you need a more sort of a smaller <coughs> strategy maybe because by the time you get there to organize the working class I think it's it's really like uh, really decays and then the other question is I think it's really a paradox but especially if you look at from the perspective of liberal modernization theory so it's quite likely that people would support the EU or support other kinds of uh, liberal institutions at the, at, at the same time support a politician who is uh, not really uh, supporting those liberal institutions if he offers solutions or at least the appearance of solutions to problems that they find uh, relevant and, and pressing for their needs. So that's what happened in the case of Hungary. So they didn't really support Orban because they wanted a strong guy who really destroys democracy and gets rid of liberalism. What they wanted is a, is a, is a guy who would uh, restart the process of uh, transition of Hungary's economic integration and, and create a new kind of uh, world. And that's how the two processes go, uh, go together. And then Orban, of course, uses the state to infuse illiberal attitudes. And the amount of money that he spends on political campaigns to install this kind of illiberal attitudes is, is amazing. So as a politician, he also has a massive impact on the rise of nationalism and illiberal values. So this is not the case So today. So this is for 2009. Would you look at it today, it's, it's uh, quite different. any connection between patterns in geography like economic development and then patterns in the political development of these type of things like when we talk about economic development I mean the distance to Budapest and the distance to Western border and I say Western border I mean the most border region yeah. here mostly and like these regions have been historically doing better economically and better this better any type of effect on their political implications in the year. Um yes and uh, no so <laughs> yes in a more vague way so in a sense that uh, uh, in a qualitative perspective the type of the industrialization that he, these uh, former strongholds of the socialist party can i think only be understood from from the perspective of uneven development so a geographically informed political economy <coughs> theory and then you also need to take into consideration its cultural implications <coughs> but I also created a data set on, on voting behavior and uh, all kinds of settlement level data uh, but I haven't been able, to, I didn't have time to, to, to look at it and uh, that's when I do this, that's when I will be able to really answer your question how town level uh, factors which I would mostly define geographic features of particular areas feeds into support for Urban. We, we, we know from the existing literature a few things uh, like size of the town significantly associated with uh, with uh, with the support for the right but we also know that in uh, deindustrialized areas or areas which saw a massive increase in poverty after the collapse of socialism saw a massive demobilization of the left and a rise in the radical right in hungary so we know these processes i can't see anyone right now so I may I yeah I might just have a question myself as well sure. and then maybe Gabo as a closing-ish question if anyone has anything pressing yeah um, after that yeah um, so my question would be you mentioned that um, of course economic um, inequality has increased greatly in the past um, years um, because of the economic policies of the regime yeah and um, some of the people that are Hungarians are familiar with current domestic politics might know that there's a huge um, real estate boom going on right now, which is, um, to me, was really interesting because there has been, in my experience, talking with people who are maybe familiar with the real estate market, a lot of money coming from people's, you know, checking accounts, a lot of sort of money that they have been sitting yeah. on, in lack of a better word. So how does that come together with the increase in, in, in economic um, inequality and the decrease of the middle class? and and so much money that the people have been sort of hoarding for years. How does that come together? Yeah. yeah, so I think that's how it comes together. So you have a massive increase in financial wealth. And when you look at this, what type of wealth this is, so basically there's been a slow increase in, uh, in, in um, 
in, in, in the wealth that is uh, held in bank accounts. So that's what most of the regular people uh, would own, the type of financial wealth. Uh, but the vast majority of this increase comes from shares, bonds, derivatives, uh, company ownership. So the types of assets, financial assets, that the upper classes, the economic elite and the upper segments of the middle class is able to own. So they have a lot of uh, financial firepower uh, to, to buy new houses. But there's also uh, an inflow of uh, foreign investors. So I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't think that it's uh, into housing markets. So I don't think that it's only about the, 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 the policies of the Hungarian state that you have this skyrocketing of, uh, of uh, housing prices in Budapest. It's also partly related to Airbnb uh, and an increased demand for, for short-term uh, st stays in these uh, houses. with an influx of uh, Russian and Chinese investors uh, that can also, of course, drive up the prices. But also recently the government has uh, intervened into the housing market, uh, which also drives up uh, 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 housing prices. So, uh, but I think the housing market really shows how this uh, polarization in wealth uh, took place. Because, uh, for example, there was a massive uh, crisis in, in, in prior debts in Hungary that it also was in part responsible for the collapse of the Socialist Party. And Fidesz uh, had sort of a political obligation to deal with this because it was such a significant part of, of their electorate. And the way they handled this crisis was basically mostly focusing on giving support uh, to, to upper middle class people uh, by allowing them to, 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 to pay off their debts. Uh, so instruments that the state uh, used were mostly targeting uh, middle class and upper middle class people. So this again contributed to, uh, to an increase in uh, polarization. And there's, a, if I might add, another parallel story to this that complicates the picture is uh, there's roughly five to six hundred thousand Hungarians by now living <coughs> abroad and uh, around three to four hundred thousand has left the country after Viktor Orban took power and these are mostly people <coughs> who are uh, being unable to, to work so this has significantly contributed to a, a massive shortage uh, of, of labor in Hungary. You also had a quite uh, uh, beneficial or good international economic environment so transnational corporations could grow, uh, money was flowing into the country from the EU as well. So all this contributed to, uh, to an economic growth after 2013-14 in, in Hungary which led to uh, a, a, sh a shortage uh, on the labor market which drove up uh, wages in the last uh, couple of years but actually when you look at uh, this wage growth uh, which is very frequently reported in the Hungarian press and, and, and treated by the government as a major success story if you compare the wage growth to wage growth in other countries in the EU is basically similar so even uh, the fact is that lower income uh, uh, income earners in Hungary, their position in the European distribution of income has in fact worsened. So they, they even though wages were growing, uh, they didn't manage to, to catch up internationally. Right, thank you. Um, so I think Gabo is... Um, yeah, so this is a more speculative question. I'm just curious. I always found this interesting how people imagined the psychology of the leading elite. Like I, see, I hear people sometimes saying about Orban that he just genuinely believes what he says and, and, and is just simply aggressive. There are some people who think that he's like coldly calculating. Did any of that appear in the interviews you and your colleagues did with the, like, with the workers? Like how do they imagine the psychology of their leaders? The psychology of their leaders? <laughs> Well, this is a bit more speculative question. Yeah, I'm, if you have any I'm not sure if they if they think too frequently <laughs> about the psychology of the leaders, but uh, they definitely perceive something that is related to the psychology of their leaders. And uh, what I would say, what they perceive in Orban is is strength and, and being active and. Uh, 
as a perception, being able to, to change things, whereas uh, other politicians being more, you know, sort of divided and unable to act and, uh, and also crucially uh, involved in, in, in post-socialist corruption affairs, which many often, very often this is seen as it's kind of a swamp where you go in and then you just even though if you are a good willing politician you just disappear there and then Viktor Orban was not in power until 1908 and by then uh, basically privatization was mostly done so people didn't perceive him as being involved in post-socialist uh, uh, privatization corruption affairs there were corruption affairs related to Fidesz but that didn't really hit the set threshold of, of, uh, of people so I would say not necessarily uh, psychology, but more kind of the involvement in, in corruption, but also their involvement in, in austerity and neoliberal uh, policies. These are the, the, the most important as far as I, I would be able to tell. But there's definitely a perception of Orban being, being strong. Um, yeah, so we've come to the final question, I think, because we're running out of time. To someone else. No, it's um, yeah, so a lot of the solutions you give in the end are very much top down solutions, what can politicians do? And I guess this is um, with the aim in another nation to prevent uh, this kind of urban phenomena. Um, but what would be some sort of bottom up approaches, some bottom up solutions? What can people do, especially the people now under urban? What would you suggest? Give it a more personal <laughs> <We all know. laughs> I'm so happy that I'm not a politician anymore because I can say I have no idea what to do or do wrong. <laughs> I don't want to sound too depressing, but actually I think it's really it's a, it's a hard fight by now because uh, Orbán has managed to consolidate his power so much that uh, and and uh, and opposition is so divided that there's really little that people can do. But still, I would say, uh, well, the, the, these conclusions for, for politics, you can also translate them for, for non-party politicians uh, in terms of uh, organizing, especially uh, going beyond uh, what I call these um, new emerging, or Budapest and a few uh, strongholds of global modernity and global modernization and going beyond to medium-sized uh, towns, the industrialized towns uh, and try to try to just basically deal with social conflicts and try to somehow rebuild communities. Now I've been an activist for years and, and a politician and I know that it's, a, it's an extremely difficult thing to achieve in, in Hungary but I would say that's perhaps uh, one of the one of the most important things. So there's really not much else to do just just to organize. I think trade unions are super important from that perspective. So and there's a there trade unions. There's a sign that because of labor shortage, the power of uh, uh, the bargaining power of labor has increased a little bit, and this has galvanized labor labor uh, union activities in Hungary. Uh, but they would also need to invest in research for, for, for you know, policy work because trade unions also need kind of new discourses, new narratives and new knowledge to construct a particular kind of solidarity community that, that would be then attractive for people. All right, I think that's all. So thank you so very much for coming and thank you for your questions. Thank you very much for the opportunity.